Hello and welcome to the Geek Nighter podcast. I am back with another episode. In today's world, many businesses face challenges to perform real-time data streaming, mainly because there is a lot of technical complexity, there's a data infrastructure that needs to be set up, and they don't have time and they don't have the expertise. So in today's episode, I have Guna Morling with me from Decodable. We did an episode together on change data capture with Debezium. So Guna is the former project lead for Debezium. And today we'll be talking about how Decodable is solving the problems and making it easier for the customers to perform real-time data streaming. So Guna, welcome back to the show. I'm really happy to have you again. And Thank you so uh, much. Really yeah, let's start with a... Back. Yeah, likewise. Let's start with a brief introduction about yourself and about your role at Decodable. So yes, as you mentioned, I am right now a software engineer at Decodable. Before that, I have been exactly for 10 years at Red Hat, where I worked on different open source projects. We spoke about Debezium on the last episode. This is what I did for roughly the last five years there. And before that, I used to work on projects from the Hibernate umbrella. I was the spec lead for the Beam Validation 2.0 spec. I worked on the reference implementation, Hibernate Search. So quite, quite a few things there. Yeah, and then last year, I decided I want to explore something new. I want to definitely get some experience in the startup environment. And this is why I decided to join Decodable because it is related to what I did before. So here we do integrate with Debezium. There is managed Debezium connectors, for instance, but also it broadens the scope in comparison to what I did before. So now mm -hmm. I can help users with their entire data journey end-to-end -end from, let's say, database through Kafka, through stream processing with Flink. And we will talk about all those things until all the way up to, let's say, Snowflake or a search index. And this isn't something I, this was not the scope of the Debezium, it's just not the scope of the project. But whereas here, I feel I really can help users with this entire end-to-end -end data journey. And as you asked about my role, so yes, I'm a part of the engineering organization. So I work on, on the actual product itself. I definitely want to contribute to Apache Flink. So this is absolutely one of my goals. And I actually, I was hoping by now I would have done a bit more, but then the things are what they are at the startup. There's always very important stuff coming up. So I was more focused on the product and I did less. I did a few small contributions to Flink, but not as much as I wanted to, but it's definitely something I want to build up. And also besides all that engineering work, I am not officially a de developer advocate or whatever, but I, I go to conferences, talk about Debezium, talk about Flink. So I write blog posts. I also do my fair share of outreach work. And lastly, I'm also always happy to raise my voice about the product, express what I feel should be there in terms of features and stuff. So it's a bit of a mixture of those three things. Yeah, yeah. I always look forward to your talks and podcasts that you, Thank you. <laughs> keep keep doing. And they're really insightful for our viewers to, to check out Gunnar's Twitter. And there's a lot of things happening. And I, I'm a little curious about... So before we get into... So Decodable is this platform that makes it easier right. for the customers to stream their data, to build streaming applications, basically. Before we go deep into it and how that works. I want, I'm curious about the name itself, like Decodable. What is the reason? Oh, uh, wow. That That's name? a good one. And you already spotted my weak side because I'm not 100% sure I should know, actually. <laughs> but I think it is about, well, decoding different kinds of data, different different formats and making sense out of them. We call ourselves the decoders. So if somebody joins, ah, nice. we always, oh, there's a new decoder around. But yeah, I definitely should check in with Eric Summer, our CEO and founder. <laughs> to learn exactly what the origin of the company name is. Cool. Let's define the problem, right? So as a customer, I have a ton of data and I want to make some decisions based on the data. I want to do analytics. Right. I want to stream data. I want to push that into a data warehouse. I have a ton of use cases when I have data, right? And But I don't have the technical expertise. I don't have the time to set up my infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I don't have the engineers, let's say, to do that. How can Decodable help me? So that's a great question. And maybe first to motivate it a little bit, because I sometimes I also see confusion around that. So I think we all should be aware of the difference between just pure data streaming and then stream processing. And data streaming, mm. essentially, this is about taking data from one place to another. And there's systems like Apache Kafka, Apache Pulsar, AWS Kinesis, yeah. many more things like that. And they really are, I would say, it's 
a transport layer in the widest sense, right? So you, you produce your messages to a topic, you have consumers, and really it's taking data from A to B and pretty much unchanged. And then on top of that, there is this notion of stream processing and in particular stateful stream processing. And this essentially concerns itself with operating on your data. So in the simplest case, mm. it could just be stateless transformations it's like a projection. So maybe you just want to take a subset out of your data and propagate this into your data warehouse. It could be then, of course, really transformations like renaming things like or maybe adjusting date formats. So that's a super common use case. You have all kinds of weird date formats and you want to find a canonic form, ISO, whatever. And this could be a, a common use case. And then, of course, there's this entire notion of stateful stream processing. Now, now you don't only look at particular records one by one, but maybe you want to join multiple topics or maybe you want to aggregate and group your topics in your data. Maybe you want to do some sort of windowed analysis. So maybe you want to know what's the aggregated revenue of my sales per category and per time window. And maybe mm. this should be like a hopping time window. So all this kind of stuff can be done with stream processing. Also, I think like fraud detection, by the way. So maybe you have weird usage patterns of a credit card, all those kind of things. And this is where systems like Apache Flink um, enter the scene. So typically they work on top of something like Kafka, but also other message sources. It could be IoT data coming in via MQTT, could be change yeah. events coming in directly from Debezium, let's say. And now a stream processing engine Flink operates on all the um, tools. Now, if you want to implement such a stream processing architecture, there's quite a few moving parts, right? So yes, you need to think about where do I get my Kafka from or whatever your streaming platform is. Where do I get something like a schema registry from? Because likely, in all likelihood, you want to manage schemas with a registry and reason about evolving schemas and stuff. Then you need to stand up a Flink cluster. You need to keep this up to date. You need to make mm. sure your hardware spec is up to the task, right? And maybe you want to dynamically scale this out and then back in again. Maybe you have yeah. stuff like security. I mean, in all likelihood, you will have security concerns. Maybe you work in a larger team on a larger organization and you want to make sure that only specific users can, for instance, examine specific data pipelines. So you need to have some sort of role-based access control. All these kind of things you need to do to run such a data pipeline in production. And this is exactly where Decodable comes in because it's a fully managed stream processing platform based on Flink, but then also based on things like Debezium, which essentially takes away all this burden. So you don't have to think about provisioning hardware, scaling it or whatever, keeping it up to date. There is RBAC rule-based access control, all those kinds of things which you need to run such a stack in production. Yeah, interesting. If I have to define Decodable in one line, can I say right. managed stream processing? Yes, it's There's a managed to... stream processing solution with the goal to bring like real time or data in real time to everyone. That's our tagline. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. You mentioned Apache Flink, right? And right. so Apache Flink, of course, is like one of the leading streaming platforms and proven at many companies that it works right. on a very high scale and battle tested and all that. Uh, but I want to know from your perspective, why Apache Flink and what are the properties or the features of Apache Flink that suits really well with Decodable? So yes, there is, there are, there have been, and there are still are many stream processing systems, I would say. But yes, you're totally right. Right now, it looks like Apache Flink is really emerging as the, it's called the winner of the stream processing wars, if you will. So for instance, just last week at Kafka Summit, we saw that Confluent announced their yeah. offering for based on Apache Flink. So really, it's the de, de facto standard where all the industry is uh, coming behind. So I think that's great. Mm. Why is this? I would say a few reasons. So first of all, there's a very active, a very large open source community around this. There's a very active and thriving ecosystem with all kinds of connectors, new features being brought into the Flink engine, all this kind of stuff. And I don't think there's any other stream processing solution which is like that actively being worked on. Then its, uh, it's feature set is just very good, right? It gives you all kinds of primitives and building blocks to reason about like fault tolerant, uh, how do you go about dealing with late arriving events, all this kind of stuff. So it's very flexible, I would say, and it really provides a very rich toolbox for 
answering yeah. all kinds of questions you would have in the context of stream processing. And then lately, there's all its non-functional requ requirements, right? So it's scalable. You can scale out a Flink cluster to many compute nodes, which means you can put lot, a lot, lots of load to it. It's very performant. And also, if you compare it to things, for instance, Kafka Streams, which is another very popular and also very good stream processing solution, for instance, it's implemented in some ways which I feel are advantageous. So, for instance, instead of having to send all the data through Kafka, which can, you know, for instance, take some time if you need to rebootstrap uh, nodes, here nodes directly interact with each other via RPC protocols, which are mm. which is just a bit more efficient. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Apache Flink is the leader in the market of right, the yes. streaming platforms. And there's a lot of things happening on top of it. By the way, I also did a podcast on Apache Flink. So for viewers, if you're curious, you can take a look. Nice. I think Flink is one of the Apache projects which has a or which have a really diverse committership. So there is contributors and committers at companies like the original founders of Flink, but also at AWS, Ivan, now Confluent, Decodable, uh, we the PMC chair, Robert Metzger works for Decodable. So there's lots of companies coming behind this project. And I think this is just great for the health of this open source project in comparison to other projects where maybe there's one dominating vendor. And then yeah. typically it's not as good for an open source community. Yeah, absolutely. And if I remember correctly, it was born in Berlin, right? Absolutely, yes. It yeah. is coming from one of the universities out of Berlin. Exactly. Yeah. It was like lots of like students or graduates yeah, working on it initially. Awesome. Yeah. Coming back to Decodable. So as a customer, I want to do the stream processing. And, and right. as, as you rightly explained, like stateless and stateful stream processing, some customer just might have like stateless use cases. That's totally fine. But for some even more complex use cases like aggregation and joining different streams right. and all that, as a customer, what kind of technical knowledge should I have uh, before thinking about something like Decodable? Mm -hmm. Of course, I guess as a customer, I need to understand my data, right? What right. kind of data it is, what is the schema and all that. But apart from that, what yeah. kind of technical knowledge is required? Yes, and I think the number one and pretty much the only thing you, you need to know is really about SQL because yeah. SQL is the primary user interface for decodable. And yeah. by a user interface, this is how you define your stream processing logic. So essentially what we do is we take Flink SQL, which is also part of the Flink project, and, and expose this to you. So the way this works then, well, you need to, first of all, of course, get your data into Decodable. So this is where our managed connectors come into the picture. And you would go to the Decodable, either web UI or command line interface. Or now we also have DBT adapter, by the way. So you would define your connectors that way. So you would say, hey, I have here this Kafka source connector, for instance, which ingests data from, let's say, MSK on AWS, or maybe your own Kafka cluster if it's accessible. But then it could also be other kinds of source connectors, right? So there, could, there could be, a, and there is a Debezium based CDC connector for MySQL and Postgres, for instance. It could be like an S3 Thor source. So all kinds of sources. And then it comes to expressing your stream processing logic. There, this is where you define your projections, your filters, your transformations, your joins, aggregations, and so on. You do all this using SQL. Let's say most of the times I can, there's also another way using, using Java. We can talk more about it, but most of the times it's really SQL. And this is very much on purpose because, well, the thinking is there's a much larger audience, in particular, if you think about data engineers, folks familiar with data warehouses and so on, who know about SQL and mm. who then will be able to implement such a stream processing pipeline using SQL. Then there is maybe Java developers or Scala developers or other developers of languages yeah. like that. So that's the idea. Yeah, and then you define your sync connector. So essentially the result from such a SQL pipeline gets inserted into another table or stream as we call it and from this stream you then would set up your sync connectors to your data warehouse to your search index to your kafka yeah okay that's great and i guess like sql is pretty old at this point and right. a lot of people have basic sql knowledge exactly yes and so that shouldn't be a problem and you mentioned about connectors right any company would have let's say a database like a relational database or exactly. something like data in s3 maybe a kafka topic to read from and 
it's all at different places. So there are different right. types of sources. And these connectors help me to connect my source to decodable exactly. and then to the processing. And then again, there is some connector that will exactly. push it to a sync. And sync exactly. is where I want the data or the process data to right. be existing. And so what is happening? So if I have to talk about, let's say I set up a connector from the database mm -hmm. of, let's say, Postgres. And I want to stream that data, just filter on certain column, say, right. get all the data where, or the customer list where country is Germany, for example, right? Yes. I write this filter. What mm -hmm. is happening? Like where, where the data is stored and where it is processed? What is like a little bit about the technical? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So essentially in decodable... We have, let's say, three major building blocks, and we briefly touched on them, but we can dive a little bit more. So the first one would be connectors. So they really concern itself with taking either data into decodable from an external system like a database or taking data out of decodable into an external system. So that's connectors. Then secondly, we have what we call streams. And streams essentially are really logical streams of data. So you can think mm -hmm. of them like a Kafka topic, but you don't really have to think about like how is this stored, how is the replicated, all this happens for you under the hood. So it's a logical stream of data. So that's streams. And now streams in the simplest case, we just connect a source connector with a sync connector. So if you just want to take your data from your operational OLTP database to a data warehouse, you would just set up a source connector, then the stream, and then the, this, the sync connector, which reads from this stream. And by the way, the stream also has a strictly defined schema. So we, uh, it's 100% type safe, you could say. And so this is how we can detect if there's like mismatches in the incoming data. And so, and also, this is just how you can reason about the data, of course, using SQL. So you want to have a fixed schema. So that's connectors. There's secondly streams. And then the last one is what we call pipelines. And we like to fight about the name internally. So we are, not everybody is happy with the name pipelines. So naming is hard, as you know. Yeah. And really, pipelines are about transforming your data. So this is the actually the actual processing step. So you could also call it processor, if you will. And now we spoke a little bit about SQL-based pipelines. Yeah. So essentially, there you define a statement where you say, select something from, and this from refers to such a stream name. Then mm -hmm. you do like your where clause. So in this case, you would do, I don't know, origin, country of origin is Germany or delivery country is Germany, this kind of stuff. But it also could be a join and grouping and so on. And then you say insert into. And this is essentially where you take the result set from the select and you specify there another stream where this data should go. And this is um, SQL-based pipelines. And just for the sake of completeness, we just recently added also support for what we call custom pipeline. So this means you now actually also can deploy your own custom Flink job. Okay. And there's a few reasons why we do this or why we decided to add this. First of all, sometimes people just have this feeling, well, we want to use SQL for our stream processing logic, but maybe there's just some things which we cannot do using SQL. Mm -hmm. Typical example is like you want to enrich your incoming data with some other data which you need, which you get from some sort of external REST service. So you cannot invoke a REST service from within a SQL statement, right? Yeah. So maybe that could be like a UDF, a user-defined function, but we don't have that yet. And this is something, of course, which you can easily do using Java. And so people, if they have this kind of requirement, they could deploy a custom a custom Flink job. Also, maybe they have already existing Flink jobs. So they don't want to have to think about running the cluster, keeping it secure and all those kind of things what I mentioned. So maybe they just won't give us their existing Flink jobs and run them on the decodable platform. So we can do that. And also, for instance, they want to use some connectors, which we don't support yet. And again, with a custom Flink job, you can do this. All this is to say we have those two kinds of pipelines. SQL-based and custom Java-based pipelines. And now as you ask what happens, if you set up a connector or if you set up such a pipeline, this will be actually actual Flink deployments which then run in the Flink cluster which, which we manage. Yeah, so basically from a customer standpoint, I am looking at a SQL interface and then in the background, there's a lot of exactly. Flink deployments, Flink workers doing their exactly, job. Exactly, right. And that is all abstracted out from the customer, which is great because I don't have to deal with any... Right. Flink failures or any uh, Flink related infrastructure related stuff, which is great because I don't know about Flink, right? I just know about SQL and right, understand exactly. my SQL. That's exactly that the great. typical user persona we're looking at. 
Yeah, interesting. You talked about the, as a customer, I can also bring my own Flink pipelines. Right. And the couple of reasons that you mentioned is maybe there is no connector at this point that right. Decodable supports, or I have some use case where I cannot express that in, in exactly. SQL. Just to take an example, I worked on, on a use case where I was... So it was again streaming use case and I was maintaining monthly aggregates of data mm-hmm. and I had to keep like data for last three months in the mm-hmm. aggregate. It was a stateful processing right? and mainly because there were some old events also coming in mm-hmm. and depending on when they happened, I would have to do the aggregate in the like the right months. Bucket. Right. And all these kind of things, are they really expressible? Or can we express them in SQL? Or this is the use case where I would need my own Flink? No, that's a good question. So uh, there is definitely support for this notion of watermarks in in Flink. So essentially, Mm. this is about for how long do you want to keep existing buckets open so you can add to them. And if I have a late event coming in, I still could update let's say the revenue from last month or the month before last month. And now typically that's a that's a function of your, let's say, business domain or maybe the systems you integrate with. So what is the maximum lateness you expect? So if my data will come in at least 24 hours late or something like that. So you would define this. This is part of this schema, which I mentioned. So there you can define this is my watermark column there. And uh, so you can specify this. Now, if you want to, and if then events come in after that, they would just be ignored. Now, if you wanted yeah. to have custom bespoke handling of late events, so I don't know, maybe you want to make an out of bands request to your data warehouse and manually update the aggregation result, which you already have written there. This is then something which you would have to do with a custom job. I'm also curious about, so let's say we talked about like multiple types of data sources, right? Like I'm using my connectors, I'm taking the data in and then Decodable is doing my processing. Typically, I don't have any benchmarking or anything like that. I've read somewhere that depending on the source that you're reading the data from, the speed of consumption might differ. And Mm -hmm. if I'm doing processing and I'm joining data from two different sources where the speed of the consumption or even the production of data is slow Mm -hmm. or different, how does that impact the stream processing in general? Okay, that's a good question. So you have essentially, you are asking about two input streams and they have a different frequency or arrival rate of data. And I don't know, let's say you do a join, then I would say what happens is this join result will be computed at the at the faster rate, right? Because whenever an event is coming in on either side, essentially, roughly yeah. speaking, this join will be triggered. So you would then essentially see output events at the at the higher rate. Yeah. Okay. I basically have to, as a customer, do I have to know that this is going to happen? Or I'm trying to figure out, do I have to think about that as well? Or... No, not really. The one thing you have to think about a little bit is we have a notion of uh, task size, which essentially is Mm. a a resource uh, allocation size in terms of memory, in terms of CPU shares and so on. So there's like a function of, okay, what's like the arrival rate of my data and maybe like the computational complexity of a pipeline operation. Depending on that, you would have to choose the right task size. Of course, there's also a pricing implication to this. So this is, I think, something you would have to keep in mind depending on your specific data like volume and also data size and to choose the matching task size. Okay, interesting. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more on the technical aspect of stream processing in general and also right. how it's done in Decodable. So whenever there's events coming in and there's like duplicate events, you want to make sure that the item potency aspect of the processing mm-hmm. is maintained, right? And the side effects of whatever processing you're doing, let's say upgrading or updating an aggregate and right. stuff like that, mainly for stateful processing, that is taken care of. So it, absolutely. is so- it... Is it like the default mode where it is item potent or uh, as right. a user, I have to 
choose some mode of no you don't really have to choose it's and you even cannot really choose so it's all exactly once uh, by default in decodable mm. which means for instance we use transactions to when sending out messages to kafka so you essentially are really guaranteed that each record and each processing step happens like happening once and so you wouldn't if you were to like restart a pipeline it would be guaranteed that you don't update the same aggregate with the same input record twice so this is absolutely guaranteed that it doesn't happen there is an impact on the end-to-end -end latency because essentially this is centered around this notion yeah. of checkpoints in flink we do a checkpoint every 10 seconds so if you want to have a very low latency then you would have to play a little bit with that but it's a general idea Okay. Yeah. Interesting. As a user, I don't have to worry about duplicate right, events exactly. and out of order events because there's watermark happening and it will take care of the out of order and update the right aggregate. Exactly. And if it's even delayed more than the threshold that you have, it will be dropped. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And when, so I was thinking more from a cost perspective, like as decodable mm -hmm. to support exactly once. Mm -hmm. You might have to do a little more heavy lifting, right? Like maintaining the transactions and making right. sure they are not duplicated. Is there a mode where as a user, I can choose to not be exactly once? Because let's say I'm mainly doing stateless processing right. and I don't have a real problem of duplicate events, right. mainly because of system failures. Yes. And I get a cost discount from Decodable because <laughs> <laughs> I am not forcing Decodable to do the right. heavy lifting. So you're not even a customer, you're negotiating it. <laughs> I like that. So it's not something which is exposed in the product. So you can, it's not like a button or whatever, but yes, you can reach out to the support team and then you could get, for instance, at least once the semantics. Yeah. I'm not sure whether there's a pricing impact on that, actually. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, actually, I, I got that question because DynamoDB gives you this discount if right. you uh, oh, okay, I see. opt for if you opt for like eventual consistent reads. Right. So that is a very interesting pricing yeah. model that as a customer, I, I can yeah. choose that. Okay. So that was the right. source of yeah. my question. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> yeah, the trade-off here is more really about end-to-end -end latency. So if you are willing to accept at least one semantics, and I'm totally there with you, I think oftentimes that's just fine, then you would be able to benefit from lower end-to-end -end latency, essentially. Interesting. Cool. Another interesting problem that I faced while working with stream processing is the way partitioning happens, right? Let's say there's certain type of events that are really like the majority, 20% of those events are consuming my 80% of the processing power, let's say, mm -hmm. mainly because let's say they are coming from heavy users or heavy mm -hmm. customers or right. heavy IoT devices or whatever. And then there are some other events. So how how is the partitioning done such that there's no hotspotting happening or as a customer, of course, right. I don't have to worry about that because Flink would be taking care of that. But do I have the power of defining the partition keys? Yes, exactly. Um, so yes, yeah. it's exactly as you say. So you can specify uh, partition keys again as part of the uh, as part of the schema. So yeah. there's really no magic happening there. Now, if you have this kind of a situation, what you described, like a hot partition which receives a large amount yeah. of load, so yes, then you could either look at larger task sizes so to be able to process that, or you would have to find. Uh, a more fine-grained partitioning scheme, right? So maybe yeah. you can say, I don't know, I have this large user which produces like 80% of my data and then you can, I don't know, maybe you can use user ID and the hour of the day or something like that as the yeah. partitioning criteria. So this would definitely require a bit of effort on the user's end. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And it's again, boils down to understanding your data and it's understanding exactly your domain right. well, because yes, that is absolutely. the expectation from the... And I don't think we can or even should make any wrong promises there. Yes, sure, we want to help you as much as we can with the operational yeah. aspects of this. And think you don't have to think about hardware and all this kind of stuff. But really, yes, you need to understand the structure of your data. What is the schema? What are the formats? What are the semantics? There is no way, I think, how we could take away that. That, that does make sense. Cool. Let's talk about the cost. What is the pricing model for Decodable? 
So the pricing model essentially is based on task hours. So as I mentioned, there's this different task sizes. And then for each size of a task, there's a price tag which you pay per hour. So that's mm. the one model. And then, of course, as it's quite common, if you are like large-scale user, you have specific requirements, there's some sort of enterprise pricing plan, which would be on an individual basis negotiated. Yeah. And from a technical standpoint, as someone who manages Flink clusters and running Decodable, right. where in stream processing pipelines, where is the main cost coming from? What is the source of the like the majority of cost? I would say it's really just managing Flink clusters themselves, keeping them mm. healthy, keeping them stable, finding the right size of hardware, maybe, or the right amount of hardware even. So maybe you have like different fluctuating requirements, like where you need to have some sort of short-lived spike of load and you need to deal with that. So all this is abstracted for you from you with this managed kind okay. of offering. So you don't have to like over-provision like that. And then I think also where we help a lot is just making all this stream processing a bit more digestible, right? So really it's, okay, you just define your SQL jobs there. You can, I don't know, specify like watermark keys or partitioning keys, as we said. But really then also lots of this other operational overhead, like I need to manage state stores and I need to make sure like my RocksDB is a fault tolerant, all this kind of stuff you don't really have to think about. And I feel this is where folks spend lots of time or lots of time and money, I would say, if they want to do this themselves. Then, of course, all this management layer on top of it. If you want to roll out a stream processing pipeline into production, you want to think about some sort of CI, CD flow. So you don't want yeah. to just have everybody randomly deploy jars to your Flink cluster. And then you don't know where are they coming from and who's owning what. So you need to have this sort of management infrastructure. You want to be sure to know, okay, what kind of revision of this particular job do I have running in production right now? And who can access it? And this, all this kind of stuff. Who can access logs? So all this you would have to build yourself if you wanted to do this by yourself. So you would spend lots of time and, and money for that one. And again, yeah. all this is taken care care of for you by using a managed platform like Decodable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And th this needs a lot of expertise, right? A lot, lot of experience because you're doing this way on, on production yes. environment. You're dealing with actual customer data. There's a, all kinds of failures happening and it, it is definitely costly and a lot of effort. Right. So I, oh, yeah. I do agree there. Yeah. And there's also things like, for instance, we have this feature of a stream of a pipeline preview. So if you work on mm. your on your SQL pipeline definition, you can then click a preview button and you will see, okay, this is how the output of this join, let's say, would look like. So that's not something which you easily could get with Flink by itself. But then for this stream preview, there is also, there is like an option where you can choose, hey, I want to feed this preview with the earliest data in the input streams or with the latest data in my input streams. And now... This is, for instance, something where I, when I started, quite often easily tripped because I always used like the latest. And now if for whatever reason there is no data coming in on my input stream, so maybe some reference data and I just don't do any update in my database, then I don't see any data on this previous stream. And I might wonder, hey, what's wrong there? And then you can spend like really like hours finding out about this. And then you realize actually it's working as designed. It's just you didn't really understood what you are doing whereas here with the product well we can guide you we can provide you with help for that so right we can detect hey you do the stream preview you said it should start from the latest offset but then we also see there is no input coming in in your source streams so then we could display mm -hmm. a help text to you and saying hey this is the situation so this is why you don't see any preview data maybe you want to start from the earliest offset and i feel it's all those details which you really only understand if you work on this for quite some time, you have some expertise, and then we can actually make this a feature in the product. And this is real like mm -hmm. then, like a, it manifests in a pop-up, which you read and the, the problem is solved for you in five seconds. Whereas otherwise you have, might have spent half a day to understand and realize, oh, actually I'm doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And the last, the one of the most important aspects of any developer role is testing what you're doing and also monitoring. Right once it's done. So right. let's say I'm using Decodable and I want mm -hmm. to test that the stream processing or whatever right. sync has in terms of data, it's all right. correct. 
right? And all the joins yes. and processing is happening fine. So decodable is like a black box for me. Right. But mainly what I'm testing is my way of defining the SQL yeah. and making sure those joins are converted correctly right. in the Flink jobs and then written to the sync correctly. So yeah. as a developer, what kind of testing strategy should I follow? So that's something we have also been discussing a lot internally. So right now you would really look at end-to-end -end tests. I think similar to many other SaaS-based services or SaaS-based products, where essentially you would you would do what your production workflow would be doing, right? So you might be using DBT to put a pipeline in place in a defined state, in a d d defined revision and so on. And then you would just feed your input streams, maybe Kafka topics, and then you would run some assertions against the, let's say, the output stream. So that's what you would do. We have been, has, we had some discussions through, we have some, so, I don't know, like local testing mode. I think, for instance, like DynamoDB supports this, where they yeah. give you like a container image, which you can run locally with test containers. I could see that. That's an option, but we, we don't have something like that right now. So it's more really end-to-end -end tests. And of course, you can have like different environments or different accounts if you wanted to. So you wouldn't run those against your production yeah. environment, for instance. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, I can just... I'm just imagining how my test suite would look like. So it will, let's say, produce an event to Kafka, write something right. on the database. Let's say I have just these two sources and then wait for some time and then read the sync and see that right. the data yes. is Yes, and better. ideally you avoid this waiting for a hard-coded amount of time. Rather, yeah. you would, I don't know, wait and make sure you like the right output on your Kafka topic. So, you know, you shouldn't yeah. do like thread sleep or whatever. So you would rather wait for the right records to show up on the output topic and then you would have a timeout. And if you don't see the records in that time, then you would fail your tests or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's the way I have also written tests for my streaming pipelines in the past. And yes. that makes sense. Yeah, I think uh, probably that, that makes lots of sense. Yeah. Cool. What kind of metrics are available for me? So there's a definitely a lot of things happening, right? right? Out of orderness, duplicate events, and then some of the events might be dropped because they are like really late in the yeah. pipeline. So how do I do all this monitoring and make sure that right. even before I enter the world of decodable, everything is working fine? Yeah. So the way that works is, yes, there is, we expose a set of metrics to you, like incoming records, arrival rate, volume, the amount of data in bytes, outgoing numbers for the same, then also like end-to-end -end lag, all those kinds of numbers. And the way you get them right now is via another stream. So essentially, we just expose a metrics stream in Decodable. And then what you could do is you could just configure a sync connector which reads from this metric stream and then for instance puts this into Kafka or wherever you want to consume it from. So that's the, we decide, okay, this should be rather generic. We expose this as a decodable stream and you can consume that one in, in any way you want, essentially. Yeah, that that's very, that is that is going to be very helpful just to understand what is happening right. and keep an eye on how I'm doing the stream processing. Okay. Even if yes, I'm absolutely. using decodable, I need to take care of what kind of workloads I have, how many, you know, yes. how, how many bytes I'm sending and all that. Exactly. And there's also, there's some configuration which we just cannot control, right? So let's say the credentials to your source database or to your Kafka. Yeah. Maybe you authenticate against Kafka and then, I know, you change the credentials or some certificate expired, something like that. So this connector cannot uh, connect any longer and cannot read from there. So yeah, you definitely want to know and find out about this. So you definitely must have this monitoring in place and still, yes, it is a managed service, so you don't have to run it yourself, but there's those kinds of failure scenarios which you are just as a user are in charge to, to take care yeah. of them. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So yeah, it looks like Decodable is going to reduce a lot of effort from the user's perspective and help me model all my streaming oh, yeah. use cases using just SQL. With this, I want to know if there is any use case where you think Dec Decodable might not be the, the best suited tool. Or I might need something more to right. make it suitable for decodable. Yeah, this is, of course, always the question everybody loves, right? I think it's generally, it's a great tool for stream processing. One thing which comes to mind is if you don't have specific connectors 
yet, right? So for instance, we just re- Apache Iceberg is a good example. We don't have an Iceberg sync connector yet. So if you want to ingest your data into Iceberg, then right now you would have to, do, you could do this using a custom Flink job, but you then would yeah. run the Flink, the Iceberg connector yourself. But ideally this was a managed connector. So th- this was would be one situation. We have the escape patch with the custom jobs, but ideally it would be easier if it's in the managed managed part and of course this gets built out over time so we add more and more connectors another thing is cloud regions i know maybe there's always this notion of like data proximity and data gravity right so maybe you want to process your data close to your database which runs into a specific azure region and we don't even support azure yet so again this support for more regions and more cloud providers that gets built out over time but maybe if you look at it right now today we don't have the specific provider, the specific region yet. By the way, we can add regions quite easily on AWS. So then maybe it's not the perfect tool for the job ad as of today. Yeah. And I think the word yet is very important here because it's still evolving. Right, exactly. So this gets up. constantly built out. So if customers ask for new regions, we assess the demand. This can easily happen. We definitely want to also grow into other cloud providers. So this is more a function of priorities, finding yeah. the right point in time to make this happen. But absolutely this is going to be built out yeah totally uh, what are the like set of features coming up in decodable oh let's see one as i mentioned more connectors for sure there is the iceberg for sure there is what we call bring your own cloud so this means essentially the mm. data plane of our offering can run in your own vpc which then is great if you don't want your data to leave your VPC. So this is something which is pretty much done. So this will come very soon. There's stuff like what we call multi-stream connectors. So essentially one connector should be able to read from multiple tables in Postgres, for instance. Right now, it's always like one connector per table. So that's something we work on. And really, the sky is the limit. So there could be stuff like replay, for instance, of streams at given offsets. So right now, you can say, I want to start at the earliest or at the latest offset from a given stream. But maybe, I know, you realize something was wrong with your data at a specific point in time. And you can identify this either by offsets in a Kafka topic or maybe by timestamps. So it would be cool if you could just go and say, I want to reprocess from this particular offset, right? So there's yeah. tons of usability features where I feel like r- right now we have a really great solid foundation, which is already very useful. But then if you go so to those features, this really provides tons of value add, which would be is super hard to build yourself. Or would, it would just yeah, take yeah. forever. Yeah, absolutely. Those features would be very useful. And as you mentioned, like it all starts from the foundation and then you build on top, exactly. like each layer. Exactly. That makes sense. And for our viewers, you can just quickly check out Decodable and try it out for free. Right. Try out exactly. some SQL and Flink processing in the back and understand how things are happening to totally. see if it's a fit for your use case. So uh, there's a Gunnar, free tier, as you say, so you can set up like a pipeline, let's say from your... OLTP data- database to Snowflake or to Elasticsearch for free. You can play with that. And then, of course, yeah. feel free to reach out to me. You can find me on Twitter. Feel free to reach out to the Decodable support team and we will be very happy to help. Absolutely. Gunnar, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And Likewise. I have definitely learned more on Decodable, on stream processing awesome. and how you are implementing it. So I'm look, looking forward to more features in Decodable and wish more success to Decodable. Uh, Thank you so much. So, really yeah, appreciate it. I really enjoyed recording the podcast with you and looking forward to collaborate with you more in future. Same. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.